About a month ago, I decided that I needed a vise. Not a workbench mounted vise, but a vise in general. So I started looking at them, and I became fascinated with the vise, and I decided that I should probably try and build one. Vices, in some form or other, have been in use for hundreds of years, but the modern vice that we know of was invented by a man named Hoyer in Germany in 1925. A bench vise is without a doubt one of the most indispensable tools in a workshop today. Bench vices can come in many shapes, many styles, and even many colors. And to look at all of these, you might think that they're very complicated to build. In fact, they're not. All bench vices have the same seven basic pieces. They all have a static body, which is usually mounted. They all have a dynamic body, which moves in and out. They all have a static jaw attached to the static body. They all have a dynamic jaw attached to that. They all have a screw head, which moves the vise in and out. They all have a handle. And they all have a clamping jaw. So this is how we're going to tackle this project. It's just seven easy pieces, and we're going to build them one at a time. We're going to start the build today with a dynamic body. I'm actually going to build it kind of at the same time as the dynamic jaw. We're going to build that as one integrated unit. I have decided to use all exotics for this build since this is going to be a piece that I'm going to keep in my workshop forever. I have decided to use purple heartwood for the dynamic body and jaw. Not only will it look pretty, but this is wood that is very high density and high strength, which will help later when it comes to clamping items. It's very hard to see, but I have laid out the shape of the side on that piece of purple heart. To keep it straight, I'm going to cut what I can on the table saw and the chop saw. After that, I'll have to switch to some handheld power tools. Many of these parts could be cut by hand, but a circular saw does a really good job of keeping it straight. And of course I'll have to use either a coping saw or a jigsaw to get into this corner to remove that part. I know that a lot of people are surprised when I tell them that they can cut purple heart or even super dense hardwoods like lignum vitae with hand tools. But no wood is really a match for a steel tool. After the first side is cut out, I will use that as a template to trace the second side so that it can be cut identically. And if this vise is something that you would like to build for your shop, then I have a complete set of detailed plans available on my website and there will be a link in the description. This is something that I recommend for all exotic woods. Many of them have a very high oil content and it's best to clean the surfaces with acetone before you glue them. This will take all the excess oil off the surface and you'll get a significantly stronger glue bond. And these pieces of cherry that I'm gluing on here are going to give our dynamic body its three-dimensional shape. We're not worried about the strength of these glue bonds. They're just there to give us a shape and you'll see why that is in a little bit. One of the cool things about this vise is it's built entirely of wood. There are no metal fasteners holding it together. In fact, the only metal is the screw and the nut, which allow the body to move in and out. And you will see as this thing comes together that it's virtually indestructible. And here is a good preliminary view of the dynamic body and jaw. I thought something that might add a lot of nice character would be to fill the gap between those sides of the jaw with something beautiful like East Indian rosewood. And that's what I'm planing down and joining up here. I 
I'm going to orient it in such a way in the jaw so that the end grain is what is facing the clamping surface. This will give us maximum strength. Here again, I did of course clean the surfaces with acetone before I glued them up. I let it dry overnight and now we'll take the clamps off. As you can see, there is no such thing as too many clamps. Now I'm going to joint that block square uh, on a couple of sides and then I will cut it to width on the table saw. Many of the cuts that I make on the table saw, I do so because I'm completely comfortable with it. I have never cut myself and I have been woodworking for 32 years. If there's a cut that you feel uncomfortable with, don't do it or find a different way to do it that makes you comfortable. Now we can see how this is going to fit inside of the jaws on the dynamic body and we're going to clean it with acetone and then glue it in place. If you have seen any of my other videos then you know I believe there is no such thing as too much glue. I always glue both sides, I clamp it very tightly and then I don't mind cleaning off the excess glue. What this does is this ensures that there is never a section that didn't have adequate glue coverage. I feel the same way about clamps. I always put as many as I can. So after it's dried overnight, we'll take the clamps off and then we're going to do a rough cut to get the bulk of that excess rosewood off of there. And the bandsaw makes the perfect tool for this. I was careful to just get close. I didn't want to risk cutting into the purple heart because that would change the shape of this dynamic jaw. Here I'm going to use a pattern cutting bit to trim the rosewood down to be flush with the purple heart. If you have never worked with East Indian Rosewood, you should. The wood is beautiful and the sawdust and shavings that come off of it are feather soft. It's the most unbelievable wood I've ever worked with. So now we'll take that pattern cutting bit and trim off the other side. As you can see here, my pattern cutting bit isn't tall enough. I didn't want to spend a lot of money and buy an expensive one, so I just used my cheap one, which is only two inches tall. That's okay, because I'll sand the excess from the center off manually with my belt sander. Now here too, I'm going to do something similar with that I did with the bandsaw. I'm just going to get close with the belt sander, not all the way. Once I get it down close enough, I'm going to take it over to my oscillating spindle sander to finish it off. Now all of the sanding could easily have been done with a palm sander or a random orbit sander. It just takes longer because you need to go slow to make sure you do a good job. In the end, I'm going to go ahead and dress it up with my random orbit sander to take off some of the deep scratches from the oscillating spindle sander. Now it's time to start adding some thickness to that dynamic jaw. We've got to make it a little bit wider and a little bit stronger. You can see now that I have the grain of the purple heart running in two different directions. So the likelihood of this dynamic jaw breaking off has just been dramatically reduced almost no matter what load we put it under. So I'm making it a little bit bigger than the jaw itself so that I can trim it later. 
Once again, lots and lots of clamps, and then we'll clean off the excess glue and let it dry overnight. Now it's time to take those clamps off, and we're going to take it over to the router table, and I'm going to use my flush trimming bit to trim those sides off and get them back flush with the sides of the dynamic jaw. Then a little bit of sanding to even everything up and make it nice and plush. Okay, the final step in making the jaw wider is cutting some angled pieces to widen it out just a little bit at the very top. And these measurements are of course included in the detailed plans that I have in case you're interested. And you can see that I've made them just a tiny bit bigger than the jaw so we can trim it back later. Don't forget, lots of glue. So here's a little trick that I use when I'm clamping something in place and it tends to slide around and I don't want it to. I can take a little bit of salt, sprinkle it on the glue, and that adds enough grit to hold the piece firmly in place so it doesn't slide under clamping pressure. It doesn't in any way take away from the strength of the glue bond. The sodium and the chloride just separate in the solution and they remain spectator ions and they don't interfere with the reaction. So lots of clamps and I let it dry again overnight. We'll take it apart and we'll trim those flush. So if you've noticed a lot of overnight glue sessions, don't worry, it doesn't take that long to actually build this vise. I did it in under a week. Uh, each time I finished a certain stage and let it sit to dry overnight, I would just work on another portion of the vise. I'm doing a little bit of custom sanding on a piece that's going to help me fill out the top part of this dynamic body. The purple heart pieces that are going on top are giving a lot of strength and integrity to the dynamic body. So you notice we have a little gap here, but we have a trick for filling that that I'm going to show you. And there's a preview of what it's going to look like. Okay, so here's that trick. You probably already know it. I basically mix purple heart dust with glue. I mix it to get a really strong putty consistency. And it has just about all the strength of glue, and it easily fills gaps. And once it's sanded, it's very difficult to distinguish that there was a gap there in the first place. Got to use the old salt trick. And you can probably imagine with the amount of glue that I use, I spend a lot of time and a lot of rags cleaning off the excess. But here's something cool you might not know. The more you wet that purple heart, the more purple it's going to get. There, that's just exactly the right amount of glue.
sanding time. And the nice thing about that putty that we make with Purple Heart or any dust for that matter is it sands just like the wood. And there you have it. The dynamic body and jaw as one integrated unit are completely done. It wasn't so tough. And there's the giant two inch size screw that's going to make this vise operate. A Coke can there for comparison in size. The jaw body is two feet long. Now we're going to cut the components for the static body. And the static body is basically a box that's going to be held together with through dovetails. So I am going to include a very comprehensive how to do through dovetail tutorial uh, for this part of the build. I thought it would be really nice if the dynamic body had two uh, strikingly different colors. So I chose Purple Heart and Padauk. African Padauk is the bright orange or red type wood. And of course, we're all familiar with Purple Heart here. And I think they make a good contrast together for the through dovetails. It's very important to remember that your sides for the dovetails must all be planed to the exact same thickness to make them easy. And now we have our sides cut and we can move on to the dovetailing portion. Okay, so here we're going to make some through dovetails. And we're making it in a little bit of an unusual box. So I just want to show you basically how they work. Uh, typically, through dovetails would, might be in a box or a drawer. And it's important that the dovetails get cut on the end grain. If the grain of the board is running this way, we want them cut on the end grain. Um, maybe on the sides, here's how we want our dovetails. So this would be considered the tail board. So what we do is we set our boards up in the right orientation, and then we'll lay them down, and we'll identify what board is what. So this is our tail board. We want the tails cut there. That's the most decorative. So we'll mark. And wherever we write is going to be the inside of our drawer. So this is the tailboard. We'll write tailboard on that. We'll write tailboard on that. We want our two tails. This will be our pin board. This will be our pin board. And that's basically that. With this, we'll take it over to the dovetail jig and work it. Okay, so here is the box we're going to create for our vise. It's very much the same, except it's a much taller box. But you can see our end grain is here, and that's what's important. That's where the dovetails will be cut. And I'm going to do the same thing. I want the tails on this side, and I want the pins on this side. After it comes together, you'll see how that works. So we basically set this up in the same orientation. We lay the sides down so we know where they go. And I wanted these to be my tail boards. And I want these two to be my pin boards. So we'll mark it here. Okay, so most of the dovetail jigs that you buy will come with two templates. One of them is for half-blind dovetails, which we're not going to use. And one of them is for through dovetails. That's this one, which we are going to use. And uh, I always like to make a note. It tells you on here uh, what's what, but this is the dovetail side, and that's the pin side. So it goes in here like this. And I've taken my dovetail jig, and I have mounted it to a board. That way I can clamp this board down to my table and cut my dovetails. Okay, so most dovetail jigs will have directions right on the jig. You can read the instructions in the book, but right on the jig is great. Uh, this is for through dovetails. Over here is half blind. Today we're going to cut through dovetails, so we'll just take a quick look at this. Uh, through dovetails, we'll need a dovetail bit to cut the tails, and we use a straight cutter bit to cut the pins. We always cut the tails first on through dovetails, and then we cut the pins to fit. We'll make a test cut on some pins, and if they need to be tightened or loosened, we can do that. Uh, so the tails get cut first, and then the jig will tell you here, uh, it says the outside surface of the tailboard 
is there. So the outside surface is going to face the jig. And the outside surface of the pin board is going to face away from the jig. We'll talk about that again when we move over to it. But for now, let's set up to cut our first tail. Before we put our boards in place, this is our edge guide. So we just want to make sure that this is loose and moved all the way out of the way. Once that's done, we'll take a backer board. The backer board has to be the exact same thickness as the board that we're cutting. And it's going to come in from back here. And rest there. Then we'll take one of our tail boards. And I had indicated that where I marked it was going to be the inside of the box. And if we take a look back over here again, the outside surface of the tailboard goes in. So this is the inside surface, so it goes out. So we'll set that up here and we'll lock that down temporarily. We'll have to get this thing situated so we get full support on the back. We can lock that down. And the next step is to get it centered. We want this board to be centered between two pins. If it's all the way to the left, then we have a lot of space here, and we have no space here. But we want it centered, ideally. So we're going to take our calipers, or just take a ruler, and we're going to measure the distance on both sides to get it centered. So the first thing I will do is eyeball it to get it close, hold it down, and then we'll use the calipers to check. You set those to zero. And I'll take a look here. So I have 0.421 inches there. We'll check this side. And it's close. Uh, that's 0.333. So I'm going to have to scoot this board that way just a little bit. And we'll check one more time. OK. I have 0.372 and 0.387, so it's 15 thousandths off. It's just about there. OK, after adjusting this one more time, we'll take a last measurement and see where we're at. OK, we've got 0.383 and 0.381. That's pretty close, just a couple thousandths off. So once we know we have this centered left and right, we know that all of our boards, all four boards, all four sides to the box are the exact same length in this dimension here. And so this jig has a stop. What we'll do is we'll move this stop all the way over to this point and we'll tighten it down. That way we don't have to measure again for the future boards that we put in. The next step is to make sure that our template is aligned properly. If we look down here, we have a groove, a front groove and a back groove. The back groove is the one that we're going to use for these through dovetails. We want to make sure that the back groove is lined up perfectly right here between our tailboard and the backer board. So this template will actually move. If we loosen these knobs, we can see the template will move forward and backward. And if you, the, there's a brass knob behind here, which will move the template forward. So we'll simply adjust the brass knob until we see these things come into alignment and then we'll tighten the main knob down on those. And we want to do that on both sides. Both sides operate exactly the same to have this line here perfectly match this junction between the two boards. Now getting ready to make the cuts for the tailboard. Yeah, in the kit, if you have this Porter Cable Kit, it comes with a straight cutter and it comes with a collar for the straight cutter. And it comes with a dovetail cutter, which I've already installed in the router. And that also has a collar. The collar's a little bit bigger. And I actually make a note on them after I get them. This one's for the straight cutter. And I've written on the other, it's for the dovetail cutter. So I mount this in the dovetail cutter. And the next thing I'm going to do is check the depth over here. Okay, so I've marked on my template here. There are instructions there, but I've marked on it. This is the through dovetail depth. It's important that this bit is at the right depth. Uh, through dovetail and any dovetail geometry uh, is very specific. A bit of a particular angle 
will only cut accurately at a particular depth. So we will check our depth here. And this comes factory preset at the right height. If you find that it's off, it's easy to adjust it. Uh, but I have tested it, it is perfect at that height. So I'll bring my bit in and I'll take a look here. I'm a little bit high. So I wanna lower the level of the cutter until it's exactly perfect with our height. And that's it right there. Okay. Here you just have to take your time and cut slow. If you have a carbide bit, it will cut through any exotic wood, no problem at all. If you have a high speed steel bit, it will do that as well. It's just a tiny bit slower. You can see my camera has a layer of red dust on it now. Tailboards have been cut. We'll set those aside. And the first thing we'll need to do is to flip the template around. This side is for cutting the tails. And this side is for cutting the pins. Put that in place. And when we cut the tailboards, the inside which is the side I marked, the inside of the tailboards faces away from the jig. With the pin boards, it's the opposite. The inside of the board will face toward the jig. And if we look here, our stop is still in place. So we'll bring this up, slide it over to our stop, and then we'll lock it down. And we can go ahead and secure the pin board. Our backer board now will have to be flipped around. This edge has already been cut from the tail, so we want to flip around to a new edge to give a nice backer for the pins. Now we just want to make sure that it fits left to right and covers that fully. We'll lock that down. And we can lock this back down. The next step is the same thing basically that we did for the tailboard. We want to make sure that these line up and there's some play here. So we want to make sure that when this is screwed down, these all line up with the seam which divides the backer board and the pin board. And I've actually pre-adjusted it so it does line up perfectly all the way across. And lastly, we want to check the depth on our router bit. So I've switched the router to the straight cutter. The straight cutter is what's necessary for the pin board. And if you look here on the jig, I just made myself a note, although it is printed on the jig. This is the straight cutter depth right here. We want to check that depth of cut. And we'll set it in here. And I have actually pre-adjusted that as well. So our depth of cut is just right. And now we're ready to begin cutting. The template opening you'll notice is a little bit wider than the straight cutter. So what I find to get the best quality of cut is to plunge in. I plunge in first to the right side of the pen opening, then to the left side of the pen opening, and kind of go back and forth like that, and it gives me the cleanest cut.
And that completes the cut. And here we have all four pieces that are cut. And unfortunately, I was dumb and I either didn't film the dry fit or I lost the footage. Uh, but it did dry fit together. And now I'm going to go ahead and glue it together. So when you're gluing up exotics, don't forget you do need to clean all of the surfaces with acetone before you glue them together. That's something I did in every case, but I didn't want to keep showing it over and over, so I did it off camera. So after press fitting them together, needless to say, there was a whole lot of glue cleanup to do. So I did that, and then we proceeded to clamp the structure together. Once that's done and clamped up, you'll need to find somebody with real small hands to clean up the glue on the insides. Luckily my wife was available to do that for me. And from the looks of it, I had just enough room to get the clamps on. Once again, after overnight drying, we can remove the clamps and proceed. You can see me or hear me in the background there working on another step of this project. I didn't realize that that was uh, so obtrusive in the video, so I'll have to pay more attention next time. So in a properly done through dovetail joint, I like to have the ends stick through just a tiny bit. And that coupled with the glue makes for a pretty aggressive surface to sand. So the easiest way to do it, believe it or not, is just to put 36 grit sandpaper on a belt sander and go at it. You do this and it just takes a couple of minutes to get it down to smooth. After that, you can progress to finer and finer grits with a random orbit sander and it works out wonderfully and you save a ton of time. I actually sanded this whole box down in probably less than five minutes. When I hit the random orbit stage, I start at 60 grit and I work my way all the way down to 220. So if you notice those dovetails, they actually looked practically perfect, but every once in a while you'll find a little one that's chipped out a tiny bit. So I use the same method I used before, I just create a little bit of putty. Here I'm doing it with the uh, paduk. I find out which of the two woods has chipped, in this case it was the paduk. I make some of the paduk putty with glue up, and I'll touch up that hole. It just takes a little bit, and once that's dry, it'll sand out and you'll hardly notice it was there. We can do the same thing with Purple Heart if you notice a chip out with that wood. And my daughter here had to stop and pose for the camera instead of working. I use a big homemade block sander to get the edges smooth and keep them square. And we're just sanding off that little bit of putty from those uh, chip outs. Okay, time for a quick test fit here. And it looks like the dynamic body is just a tiny bit too tight to fit inside of the static one. It's no problem at all. We're just going to sand that down a little bit. And now you can see it fits in perfectly. A little bit of finish sanding and it'll be good to go. I hope you'll join me for the rest of the vice build. It was a great project and a lot of fun to do.